the time machine is malfunctioning, and the valiant traveler prepares for an emergency landing. It's not a question of where he'll land, but when. And whenever he is, he'll have to develop a plan to survive. But is there any way a human being can survive a billion years in the past? A survival-minded individual probably has a plan for just about any situation. Talking to your prepper uncle, he's probably asked some ridiculous questions. What's your plan for surviving if you're stranded on a desert island? What about in the middle of an Alaskan wilderness? Odds are your answer for that might have been not wind up in those situations. But for survivalists, the fun is coming up with the plan. But there are some situations that are trickier than others. You could be dropped on most places on Earth at the moment, and you could likely survive. But what about other times? That's where some serious planning and luck comes in. If you've got a time machine on hand, of course, but a modern-day traveler would have to be very careful to survive in the distant past. In more modern history, such as several hundred years ago in pirates or medieval times, a person would need to avoid alarming the locals with modern technology or clothes for the fear of being labeled some dark sorcerer and being imprisoned or killed. And the further back you go, the more challenges you'll face. When you go back before the start of Modern Man, you're faced with the wild world. Among the challenges include beasts that dwarf the size of any predator or prey in today's world, plant life that may be indigestible to today's stomachs, and novel viruses or parasites that our immune systems might not be able to handle. And that's before even looking at the atmosphere, which might have a slightly different composition to the one we know today and could wreak havoc on a person's immune system. Still, a savvy and careful survivalist might be able to eke out survival based on careful hunting and foraging. But could anyone survive before the dawn of man, before dinosaurs walked the Earth? A billion years ago, Earth has changed a lot to become the planet we know today. In the early days before the dawn of life, it was barely even a planet at all, instead being a malleable growing orb made up of unstable magma that was constantly being hit by objects from space. The temperature of Earth back then made it uninhabitable for organic life, and that's even without mentioning the lack of a breathable atmosphere. It resembled a visit to Venus more than anything else, but this era known as the Hadean Eon ended around 4 billion years ago. For the next 1.5 billion years known as the Archean Eon, a lot of changes happened. The Earth started forming continents, although they shifted around frequently. An atmosphere emerged, but it was mostly composed of volcanic and greenhouse gas, far from breathable, and the very first form of life, the primitive single-celled beings known as prokaryotes, started to emerge in the primordial sea. And that's where we come in. Welcome to the Proterozoic Eon. Starting around 2.5 billion years ago and continuing for almost 2 billion years, its name translates to early life. And this is where the building blocks of the world we live in emerged. But that doesn't mean it's time to go camping. Any human who arrives here will have massive challenges to overcome that could make it impossible for them to live more than a few minutes. But let's just say this isn't a crash landing. Let's say this is an exploration mission, and our human visitor is coming with enough supplies to explore a foreign planet. Because at this point, that's exactly what Earth is. This is the first era where we have actual extensive records of the Eon as the Archean Eon left most of its fossils in the deep water. However, during the Proterozoic Eon, rock deposits were formed in shallower areas and many remain almost intact from that era. Scientists have been able to develop a full picture of the climate during that time, and one thing that is clear is that during certain periods, it was brutal. One thing's for sure, if a person had arrived at the very beginning of the period, they would have had a much harder time surviving. Oxygen had not yet begun forming in the air in large quantities, and the planet was going through a snowball Earth period, a massive global ice age, the first of its kind. And then something very interesting happened. The first forms of life emerged during the Archean Eon, but they were simple single-celled organisms deep in the sea. Photosynthesis, the process by which organisms absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen with the help of light, was occurring, but only in small amounts, meaning the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere was minimal at best. Keeping production of oxygen down, minimal sinks of sulfur and iron were taking up much of the gas and starting to grow. But those stores of unoxidized minerals weren't infinite, and they eventually ran out, which allowed oxygen to start building up. It's believed that oxygen levels in the atmosphere started rising around 2 billion years ago, and that allowed life to begin evolving. So is it time to take off that helmet and take a deep breath? Think again. A higher oxygen level is relative. Cyanobacteria, the dominant form of life now, are releasing oxygen into the oceans, but that's only managed to get the oxygen level in the atmosphere up to around 2%. By comparison, today's oxygen concentration in the air we breathe is around 21%. 
So the low oxygen level in the Proterozoic era would only give humans a few minutes of air if they were taking shallow breaths, a far more extreme version of what happens to people when they climb to the top of the mountain. So keep that helmet on and take a look up because things are very different. Earth is pretty close to fully formed now, but the planet is still finding its equilibrium. If our intrepid time traveler has a watch, they'll notice something very surprising. A day on Earth, sunrise to sunrise, is only 18 hours. That means the Earth is spinning much faster than it does for us. As the planet continues to settle into place, it'll find its current pace, but right now, the structure is still very much in flux, and that definitely applies to the shape of the world. Even today, we're a water planet, with our continents being more like large islands in the middle of a massive sea. But a billion years ago, this was even clearer, because the primordial sea that was the source of all life only had one island in it. This wasn't Pangaea, the famous supercontinent that's home to the dinosaurs. This was the much earlier supercontinent, Rodinia, that assembled 1.25 billion years ago and continued accumulating landmass for almost a half a billion years. This was part of the process that began when a previous supercontinent broke up, and it's believed that this was a relatively unstable continent, with the connections between many fragments being tenuous at best. This is the earliest supercontinent that we have concrete reconstructions of, and it was surrounded by a super ocean named Mirovia. And it was in this ocean where things started to happen. Now, let's say our traveler has their basic needs taken care of. They have an oxygen supply, so they don't need to worry about the Earth's extremely thin atmosphere, and the protective gear can shield them from the environment. The sun at this point in the Earth's history is much cooler than it is for us, and the Earth's climate has shifted dramatically. While for a while the atmosphere made Earth much hotter than it is today due to the heavy presence of greenhouse gases. But as oxygen levels increased and many of the previous single-celled bacteria that were emitting greenhouse gases died off, the temperature dropped dramatically. It's believed this great oxidation event, which led to the conditions that made complex life on Earth possible, led to a drop in temperatures that made the warmest areas of Earth roughly equivalent to the current temperature of Antarctica. Survivable but not for long. A billion years ago, Earth was not in a snowball Earth period. But anyone who's gone to a place up north in the dead winter knows that this doesn't mean it's possible to spend a long time outside, and few of those locations have temperatures akin to Antarctica. Most of the Earth is even colder than that, which means that the threat of frostbite and hypothermia would be a constant presence. A visitor would likely need a climate-controlled suit to survive on Earth for any length of time. Oh, and remember, there is no escape. A big part of what makes surviving on Earth one billion years ago so challenging is that there are none of the elements we've come to take for granted. When it's too hot or too cold out, we run to the nearest climate-controlled building. Well, none of those are around here unless that time ship makes for a convenient escape nearby. But even in the wild, there are usually some escapes. When the sun's beating down, people will head to the nearest tree. When the cold's getting a little too much, it's time to build a fire with some kindling and a huddle around it. Good luck with that here. If there's one word that describes Earth's climate during this period, it's probably flat. The surface of the supercontinent is mostly newly formed surface rock, some less stable than others. Mountains will have begun forming, but they're largely just more rock. You might be able to find some shelter from the elements under a rock shelf, but you won't find any of the markings of a modern-day ecosystem yet. Forget about finding shelter under a shady tree, you won't find any leaves. Because plants haven't evolved yet. There's life on Earth when you arrive, but it's a bit of a deceptive description. There might be other organisms around you, but you won't be seeing them. That's because the vast majority of life on Earth at this moment is single-celled organisms and primitive plants, many of which are too tiny to be seen with the human eye, and most, but not all of them, are found in the ocean. At first, scientists believed there were no multicellular organisms on Earth and nothing on the land at this point, but that's no longer thought to be the case. Rather, there is evidence of sexual reproduction among eukaryotes, as well as plant organisms like algae moving on to land. It's also believed there were some primitive fungi on the land at this point. All of this means is that you should keep that hunting gear on the time ship. Food supplies on Earth at this point would be near non-existent for any human. It's possible that some traces of algae would be found on the surface level if large colonies were formed. A person stranded there could theoretically scrape them up and see if they were edible, but the odds are the answer would be a resounding no followed by some intense intestinal distress. Algae are rarely edible and can bring the risk of severe food poisoning in the modern day, and it's impossible to guess just how prehistoric algae or fungi would interact with the modern digestive system. And even if you did find enough algae, the process you'd need to collect enough for survival would be incredibly difficult and time-consuming. 
so hopefully you have enough protein bars on the time ship. But what about the oceans? Are they the key to life? These prehistoric oceans are where complex life first emerged, with them playing host to the earliest apex predators, including a massive sea scorpion that could prey on anything around it and could grow up to six feet in length. With its fierce claws, it would make a powerful foe for an ambitious fisherman, and it probably also tastes delicious when steamed and served with drawn butter. But you get those thoughts of seafood out of your head, these beasts are a long time away from where you are now, about half a billion years away. At this time, the primordial ocean is mostly a DNA stew, containing fast-evolving single-celled molecules and primitive plants that are evolving more and more by the century. So even if you stick a fishing net in there now, you're coming up empty. Similar to scraping up algae and fungi on land, the only thing you'd pick up while trawling the ocean a billion years ago is a complex mix of primitive plants and single-celled organisms that are in the process of evolving. You certainly wouldn't get any nutrition out of them, and if you collected enough, odds are you'd be introducing some seriously toxic elements into your digestive system. Food would be one of the biggest challenges facing any arrival on this ancient planet. But what about a far more pressing need? A human can live without food for several weeks, with severe weakening happening after a month and death usually occurring in about two months at most. But we aren't so lucky when it comes to water. Dehydration comes on quickly and has serious consequences for anyone who's deprived of water. The rule of three says a person can live three minutes without air, three weeks without food, and three days without water. But none of these are absolute and they depend heavily on the climate. What's clear is that even a few days without water will have devastating impacts on the body, including permanent damage to the organs and it's impossible to survive more than a week without water in the best circumstances. But at least there's water on primordial Earth, right? Much like our world, because there's water all around you, it doesn't necessarily mean you have something to drink. That's definitely been the case for many a shipwreck survivor who broke down and drank some ocean water, only to wind up worse than they started due to ingesting a mouthful of salt water. But what was the Earth like a billion years ago in the primordial soup of the mega ocean? The seawater of the era would be much more complicated in chemical composition due to how active it was with microbes, and drinking it would have the same risks as trying to fish from it. Anyone who wanted to drink it would need a very good water filter. Fresh water would only be available in very limited amounts from precipitation, but due to the composition of the atmosphere, it's impossible to know exactly what that would be like. Impossible or maybe not. Believe it or not, we have an idea of what water from a billion years ago tasted like. Back in 2013, a paper in Nature magazine revealed that water trapped under the surface of Canada, one and a half miles below the ground, had been discovered. This was believed to be the oldest isolated water reservoir ever discovered, and it was so old that dating it was a matter of guesswork. But they knew that it was at least a billion years old, maybe twice that. That means it had been isolated as much as half the time that Earth existed and now it was being tested for the first time. Scientists analyzed it as best they could, and then they did the only thing they could in the name of science. Bottoms up. Barbara Sherwood Lawler, one of the scientists involved, was the lucky one who got to take a sip of the water, and surprise, surprise, it tasted terrible. She described it as much saltier than seawater, as well as having a different consistency than today's water. It almost felt like a light maple syrup and turned into a menacing orange color when it made contact with oxygen. This is because of the high mineral content in it, particularly iron. It's not clear if the long isolation affected it, but if this was a representation of what water was like back then, odds are no one's getting a cool glass of water from a billion-year-old Earth. So let's look at the tale of the tape. Could a human survive on Earth a billion years ago? The question is, with what? Earth back then had few to none of the building blocks of what we needed to survive. The atmosphere was breathable but only for a few minutes, as the lack of oxygen would quickly lead to unconsciousness followed by death. The water on Earth at the time was not potable, and the only fresh water available was likely extremely limited. There was neither plant nor animal life, which meant no food supply. The climate, while it was starting to resemble our Earth, was likely brutally cold, and the weather fairly unpredictable. The faster spinning Earth and the unstable continent meant that the Earth was highly volatile and there was no natural shelter for a human to hunker down in. Tectonic activity from the shifting plates was common, and a devastating earthquake could endanger a visiting human in a hurry. Unprepared and unequipped, a human's life in this environment would be measured in minutes because it was not a world meant for us. But that doesn't mean it was totally unsurvivable. Visiting Earth a billion years ago, if possible, would be approached very much like a mission to another planet. This means highly specialized gear designed to circumvent every single element of the environment. 
but in some ways this would be much simpler than heading to Mars or Venus. For one thing, there's one element of this world we're used to, gravity. Gravity has existed since the planet was formed several billion years earlier, so visitors wouldn't have to worry about unpredictable events knocking them off course. Additionally, there is an atmosphere, and it isn't actively toxic, so while a spacesuit-like outfit with life support would be essential, a tiny flaw wouldn't mean instant death. But the longer the visit, the more resources would be needed. Any visitor to this world would need a suit that could provide them with protection from the frozen atmosphere. It would need to be hooked up to a constant supply of oxygen, as there would only be a few minutes warning before it was too late should the supply be interrupted. That's the immediate threat, but if this was a longer term mission, other supplies would be needed, namely food and fresh water. Neither are available on Earth during that time, so a good supply of fresh water and some simple packaged foods would go a long way toward extending the visit. The good news is, as long as the visitor was hooked up to oxygen, they could briefly take off their helmet to eat and drink safely outside of the confines of their timeship. Now we need just one simple thing, a time machine. But what would the purpose of this visit be? It would be a desolate world with only the building blocks of life and no one would be excited to see it, except of course scientists. Evolutionary biologists would no doubt be thrilled to get a look at the life on Earth in its earliest stages before the evolution of life took a quantum leap. At this point, life on Earth is cooking, and everyone knows that a lot of chemical changes happen in a hurry when you cook. The Proterozoic Eon might have seemed like a laid-back period for Earth, ending with another snowball Earth period that froze much of the world solid, but under the surface it was anything but, because in the next few hundred million years a lot would change. The Proterozoic Eon would end approximately 538 million years ago, and animal evolution would begin a little before that, around 750 million years ago. A massive glacial period during the era would have dramatically affected evolution, but the real game changer would come around 600 million years ago, when the accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere would reach critical mass, forming the ozone layer that would protect organisms from the sun's ultraviolet radiation and create the conditions that would allow life to flourish. Multicellular organisms would begin developing in the millions of years that followed, which led to what's known as the biological Big Bang, a massive evolution of animal species where most of the major animal phyla began evolving. Everything surrounding us today can mostly be traced back to that point. By the end of the Proterozoic era, familiar sea species like comb jellies, sponges, corals, and sea anemones would evolve and take their place in the ecosystem, and Earth would only look more familiar from there. The Phanerozoic Eon, the next to follow, leads up to the present day and began with the Paleozoic era, which was where life began to truly evolve. First came common species in the ocean like crustaceans and mollusks, and life on land began to evolve around 530 million years ago. The first fishes date back to 485 million years ago, notable since these were the first vertebrates. Around 365 million years ago, the first vertebrates began walking on land. Within 2 million years of that, sharks were in the ocean, insects were on land, and would soon gain flight, and rich plant life covered the surface as forests began to form. Amphibians and reptiles would soon follow, with some resembling animals that we still have today. It was becoming the ecosystem that we survive within today, sort of. Even then, the odds are a modern-day human would be very vulnerable. The makeup of the atmosphere would resemble ours more closely, but would likely have a much higher level of carbon dioxide. We'd also not be fully equipped for all the pathogens that would be forming in the area, nor would the world be equipped for us. While a human would be far smarter than anything living at this time period and would probably handle it with ease in a hunt, it's likely flesh of ancient animals might still be undigestible for a visitor. And the biggest problem with time travel is that it's one big butterfly effect. Even if a human survived on Earth in the distant past for an extended period, it's impossible to predict all the variables. We're carrying countless bacteria with us all the time, and even if one escapes containment and enters the environment, Odds are the whole ecosystem could be felled. It's not just our immune system that isn't prepared for them, they're not prepared for us. And this doesn't simply apply to the ecosystem from more evolved eras. The single-celled organisms in the primordial soup a billion years ago could also be very vulnerable to the countless single-celled organisms that we have in our bodies at all times. Which means even if we survived a vacation to the world a billion years ago, it's entirely possible that the world we visit wouldn't. Which means that the ethical scientists would likely look at the prospect of traveling back in time, turn off the time machine, and do some safer research. This means, of course, there's some tech baron out there somewhere planning to offer vacations to a point in time of your choice. As soon as he perfects that time machine, he'll make Jurassic Park real. What could go wrong?
Want to head back in time to a less primordial adventure? Watch what was the worst time to be alive in history, for which locations you should pass on, or watch this video instead.